Well, good morning, Cornerstone. Like always, I, I hope you're well. Um, I hope this last week of just worshiping Jesus has been one that has been impactful and has really impacted those that are around you. Now, one of the things that we're, we're doing, and we started this really back in around Easter, is we're starting a series on this idea of bearing fruit. And we kind of laid that out last week as this idea of living in such a way that it, that it matters. And not only that it matters, but they, there was this idea in John 15 of something that just, it lasts. We want it to matter and we want it to last. Now, if, if you remember right back to Easter, one of the ideas that I tried to bring out was this idea that, that our world isn't right. And we know it's not right. Now, in that, though, it feels like that everybody, including probably you and I, are feverishly trying to, to do what in some ways only God can do. We, we know that, that there's something in us, but with every man-made religion, every philosophy, every governmental system that's out there, all of these things have tried to make the world a better place, but they just can't. And I think that's what makes Jesus' words in John 14, 6 just so powerful. They're exclusive. And I, and I don't think, I think sometimes we as Christians, we proclaim them arrogantly. It just, this is the only way. He is the way. He's the truth. He's the life. There's, there's no other path out there. It was, it was a simple, just a statement of fact. Only those who believe, which we're going to kind of start talking about in verse 12, that, that come to Christ by faith. These are the only ones that can be made into what we started to talk about on that first Sunday, this, this, this new you that will now be headed towards this new place where the world is right and we're right. And one of the things, though, that I think is important to this is that the goal of Jesus <clears throat> is not just in this that we would talk about the new place and the new you, because in verse 6, it has a direction, which really is, I think, the most important of all of them, that we would be with the Father. See, that's another thing. I don't, I don't know if we as humans even kind of even know it in many ways, but being with God, being in his presence and enjoying him is, I think, really the greatest thing that is at the core of who we are as humans. We long to be near our creator. We, we in some ways, even I think when we look into outer space, there's just this longing of something greater and that, that fulfillment of the heart is really found in God. And in many ways, the reason we do that is because God created us that way. That, that's who we are. In Genesis 1, right, when, when God created people in his image, he created us in such a way to reflect his glory, which, is, which means that we were in many ways designed by God to display his character in the world. Now, unlike all the rest of creation, that's, that's our exclusive privilege. No doubt the heavens declare the glory of God, Psalm 19 but the capacity and ability to reflect his character is reserved for us. And I think this is what's so devastating is that when people rebelled against him, right, by, by choosing not to reflect him, by choosing not to, to engage in displaying his character and instead to display themselves, to make this world about themselves, to in many ways to kind of claim a position of God that we don't have, everything got broken and the greatest break that happened, you'll see this like in Genesis 3, people could no longer be in the presence of God. Now this reality meant also, and I would say it this, the moment that that relationship got broken, we could no longer be the people that God intends us to be. We can no longer reflect his character. Humans were now living just, in, and I think we hear this word a lot, just that sense of brokenness in a broken world. And thus, I think, began the quest to find this new place and this new you. But I think the greatest news about the Bible in regards to us is, is that God, from the moment that humanity sinned, began his plan. And his plan was not just about this place that we are, this new place we are, that we have in store for us. It's not even just about the new you. But more importantly, he had this plan to restore that relationship with people between him and us to truly draw us near to him because it is only in that nearness that we can ever be the people that that God intends us to be. So in my head, I was thinking this, if Jesus would have stopped short by just telling these guys about a future place and a, a future new you, 
it, it would have been just, I, I don't know the words, but maybe just entirely incomplete. And I think sadly in many people's existence within the church, they stop short of this full explanation of the intent of what it means to be this new you, but more importantly, in this nearness to God. I think we do this in a lot of ways because I, I think the major concern for many Christians is just like maybe how do we go to the good place and avoid the, ba the bad place? And again, that, that's a good thought. We don't, we don't want it to spend an eternity apart from God. But Jesus' main emphasis that you're going to look at when we look at John 14 through 17 is just this idea of how humanity now can be near God. And from that nearness now be the people that he's intended to be. When he died and in his resurrection, he kicked down the door in such an immediate and a real way that now both then and now, not just in the future, God had a much bigger plan of drawing us to himself, of being the people that we were intended to be, of being able to truly display his character in the world. And so that's what I want to look at this morning. When Jesus was raised, everything would change. Nothing would be the different. People would now have this nearness. But the question that I kind of want to wrestle around in our heads is how is God going to do this? How is that going to happen that people can be that way? Well, last week, if you remember, we kind of laid out three kind of important relationships that are going to come out of John 14 through 17. One is the relationship that God has with his people. In other words, we talked about how do we be the church to God? There's another component of it in John 14 through 17 is how do we be the church to the church? How do we, be the, how do we have a relationship with one another as God's people? But then the third one was, how do we now be the church to the world? How do we be the reflection of God? How do we display his character into the world so that people might know, John 17, that the Father sent the Son? And really where we're going to start honing in on, we're going we're to zero in on, especially this week, and I think almost, and also next week, is this special relationship that God has with his people. So if you've got your Bible, if you've got your devices, if you've got your phone, I don't know, whatever you have that you read God's word, pull it out, go to John 14. We're gonna start in verse 12. And so that's where I'd like you to open up. And that's where we're, we're, we're gonna go this morning. Now, everything that Christ would say to those guys on that night that he was with them was really based around this promise that he has in John 14, 12 through 14. So let me, let me read it to you. And I want you to listen closely, read intently with me so you can kind of pull this out because it's gonna, it's gonna shape in a lot of ways where we go. Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. And greater works than these will he do because I am going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. And we're going we're gonna to be hitting on verses 13 through 14 a little later. I, I want to I wanna really zero in on verse 12 because when I look down in it, it's crazy. I mean, if you look at it, right, it's mind-blowing to be honest because anyone that's ever followed Jesus long enough knows that to do the works that Jesus did, man, it seems like just absolutely so out of reach. I mean, he perfectly reflected the character of God. He, he lived as humanity was intended to live. He, he lived in that way that when God designed people, he fulfilled it. Then when you see down here that Jesus said his followers would do greater works than these, it, it almost seems like impossible. I mean, is what he's saying here like Jesus did? He walked on water, healed people from the dead. Is this what we're gonna be doing I've never spoke to a storm. I, I've never calmed it before. Did it really mean what it seems that he was saying here? What exactly, again, this is what I want to drill in. What exactly will God's people do that will have this essence of Jesus that's just attached to it? That will have some way in it this character and quality that are like his in the works that he did. That, that it will fulfill within us this longing that we have to live as God created humanity as he intended us to be. And even in some ways when I look down there, how in the world will it be greater? 
Well, to get there, I think what we have to do is we, we're, we're going to look at first how God would in some ways do these works within people, and then we're going to look at how they were greater. Okay, so first we're going to look at this idea of how he would do the works, how this would happen in us and through us, but then secondly, in some ways, how it would be greater. Now, to, to, to kind of understand this, we kind of have to take a running start, and I'm so thankful all of us have been reading about the life of Jesus, because this is very important to kind of understanding where we're going, because for the last few months... We got to not only observe Jesus, but we got to see how people were kind of reacting and interacting around him. Now, one of the things that you should have noticed is that as hard as people tried to understand who Jesus was, in many ways, his words and even who he is and was were just veiled to them. <laughs> they, they, maybe the word that you would use there is, is right, they, they just couldn't get him. Even the closest followers of Jesus, while they were around him, they were so often like, Jesus, what in the world you were, saying, were you saying? And even the only way that they sometimes understood what he was saying and what he was trying to do is because he was explaining it to them. But the reason that they could get it, and this is important to where we're going right now, is because they were near him. But it wasn't just in getting it, it was even the things that begin to come out of their life. Like seriously, one of my favorite stories of all time is when Jesus, right, is coming out walking on the water in the middle of the storm and Peter says these words, you know, tell me to come to you. Who would say that? Be it in that moment, Jesus is like, all right, come and he gets it, he walks on water in a powerful way. Now, no doubt there was a miracle, but in it was the character of God reflected through Peter because he was near Jesus. And I would say this, it's at the core of what humanity was intended to do with God, trust him. Out of him flowed that character of trusting God in that moment. One of my other favorite moments, and again, it revolves around Peter because I, I kind of relate to him in a lot of ways. But there they are all sitting around, and Jesus says, who do people say that I am? And, and, you know, a few of them say, oh, you know, some say that you're Elijah, some say you're John the Baptist, you know, things like that. And, and then just Jesus looks square at him, and he says, but who do you say that I am? And of course, Peter, man, later we find Jesus is the only way you would have got this, is the Father revealed it to you. But in that nearness to Jesus, he says, you are the Son of God. He got it. Why? nearness there's something that happens to people when they're near God now we also find when he wasn't near God right like if you just think about the kind of the, the pinnacle moment of his failure was when he denied Christ three times when he denied him in that specific moment we run into a Peter that suddenly was this one that trusted God this one that understood who Jesus was but then when he's far from him what does he do he kind of just falls apart this is the reality I want you to see in this moment is when we are near God, what comes out of us is we become these humans that God intended us to be. But when we're far from him, we begin to just, again, like Peter did, fall apart. And I think in many ways, I, I was thinking about this even this morning, that I think the reason that these guys didn't want Jesus to leave is they couldn't imagine what life would be like without him living as humans were intended to live, there was something that happened to people that was powerful. Now, this is what I want you to see, though. I want you to look back into God's word, and I want you to look at chapter 14, and I, I want you to watch what would happen to their, the lives of these guys, not when they're around Jesus, but actually after Jesus would leave. There's something that would happen after Jesus' death, after his, his resurrection, after he goes to the Father, that was going to have the same character. They were going to display the same things as they were around Jesus, only in many ways, and this is where we're going to start to get this idea of greater, it would be greater. So look at verse 15. I love this. He just says to them, you know, after I've died and rose again and went to the Father, you'll keep, you'll, you'll, you'll obey my commandments. Verse 20. You will know that I am in the Father and you in me and I in you. Look down at verse 23. You'll keep, you'll, you'll, you'll obey my word. Why? Well, because, look at verse 24. You'll hear the Father's word. Verse 26 now, you'll be taught and you'll be able to understand. 
Verse 27, you'll have peace, that promise of God from the Old Testament, shalom, even in the midst of the chaos, you will find things right. Verse 28, you'll rejoice in the things God rejoices in. Verse 29, you'll be able to believe. In other words, just to kind of to think this through a little bit more deeply, they and all God's people after Jesus goes to the Father would eventually begin to do the works Jesus did only in many ways now. It would be displayed greater. They would live as God intended. In fact, I think one of the things that's powerful when you read the book of Acts, you see this come to life. You see these people living in this powerful way that they never imagined that had the the characteristics and traits of not only the life of Jesus, but what they were like when they were around Jesus. Definitely not perfectly. Gosh, I'd never want to convey this idea that like we as Christians can somehow live this perfectly, but they would eventually understand more fully who Christ is and do the works they'd seen Jesus doing and experienced while they were around him. But again, it it, it throws this question in your head. What was it that would make it possible after Jesus was gone? Well, to answer that question, I want you to look with me at verse 16 so that we can see not what would make this happen after Jesus is gone, but more importantly, who would make this happen? Who was it that was coming that was about ready to make this happen? And, And we can see this down there in verse 16. Here's the one that he promised his followers. Look at this. He said, and I will ask the Father... And he will give you another helper to be with you forever. But who's that? Well, in verse 17, if we keep reading, he's called the spirit of truth. And in verse 27, when we look down in there, we learn his formal identity, the Holy Spirit. The third person of the three in one Godhead was about to do something incredible when he came to them that was unseen by people in many ways since the days of Adam and Eve before the fall. There was something huge that was about to happen. Now to get what Jesus meant though about the Holy Spirit, there's a, there's a word that's used in fifth, verse 16 that I think we need to wrestle with because it affects everything that's about ready to happen in chapters 15 through 17. Now in many ways, it, it like seems like such a small, inconsequential word, but it's crucial. And, and I'm gonna use Greek here, not because I'm trying to make you think I'm smart, but I think it'll just help you kind of understand the difference between these two words for this word, Another. See what I mean? It seems so small and inconsequential, but that's the word. Now, there's two words in Greek for another. You can either use this word alas, which is actually used here, or heteros. Alas means one of exactly the same kind or of just the same kind. Heteros means another of a different kind. So let me see if I can give you an example that will help you kind of understand that. <clears throat> Now imagine with me that I, that I held up a golden, uh, delicious apple. They're, they're my favorite apples. And I told you that this week you are going to get the delivery of a basket full of, of delicious apples that will be coming to your door. But now imagine with me, I go to the store, you know, there's a Walmart right over here next to Cornerstone, and I go to buy these golden, delicious apples, but there's not enough to get out to everybody. So I look next to them and I think, well, the word delicious is in red delicious apple, so I'll get a red delicious apple for the rest of the people. Now what that means is when the basket shows up, some of you will get alas apples. You'll get apples of the same kind that I held up and others of you will get heteros apples, an apple of a different kind. Now here's where this is important. The word used to describe this helper, to describe the Holy Spirit, which is coming to them at this point, meant that he was in essence just like Christ. He wasn't another of a different kind. He was another of the same kind. These guys didn't need to be troubled because the another helper was coming and was in essence just like Jesus Christ. 
You see, so much uh, uh, in many ways are, are Jesus and the Holy Spirit the same that in Romans 8, 9, even the Apostle Paul calls him the Spirit of Jesus. Now, I think that's why when you think through this, Jesus told them he wouldn't leave them in or as orphans because the, the, the exchange between the two was the same. Jesus was saying, when you experience him, you, you will experience me. Well, what those guys experienced when Jesus was with them, it would be identical. Yet I want you to notice something down in verse 16. It wouldn't be for three or four years like they had with Jesus. The Holy Spirit would remain with God's people. Look at that word, forever. He would be with them. In fact, that word that's used for helper there, is, it, it, we use the word paraclete sometimes, and that word para means along with. He will be with you forever. But what's so interesting about this is they had actually already seen and experienced the Holy Spirit and he had dwelt with them in and through the life of Christ. That's why he reminded them, look down at verse 17, that they already knew the Holy Spirit because, because look at this, he dwells with you, present tense. They didn't even know it, but right there as Jesus was talking to them, the Holy Spirit was present. See, some of them even saw way back in the beginning of Jesus' ministry when the Apostle John baptized Jesus, the Holy Spirit descended upon Jesus like a dove. And everything that you read, especially in the book of Luke, constantly there's this reminder that the works that Jesus did were accomplished in the power of the Holy Spirit. Everything that Jesus did while he was on earth was intimately connected to the Holy Spirit. And I think in, an, in a reassuring way, what he was trying to tell them, you already know the Holy Spirit because you've seen him in and through me. However, and again, I want you to see something down in verse 17 because they would know him even more intimately. Because Jesus was going to the Father, the Spirit would now be, look at verse 17, in them. He would be in his people. Again, we're starting to develop out this idea of what made it greater. Jesus Christ, as much as he longed to, could not be in them while he was in the flesh on this earth. But yet in this particular moment, he's saying, there's a come a time where he will not only be with you, but he will be in you and through his presence and power, they would do the works as Jesus did. You will be empowered to now be the people that God intended you to be. The Holy Spirit was coming, and this is the idea. Life for God's people would never be the same, and we're starting to build in a greater understanding what this idea of greater things than these you will do kind of means. It wasn't so much about our ability to do something, but there's a difference between how life was before Jesus died and was buried and rose again and went to the Father and the Spirit came, and there was something that was going to happen after that was real and powerful. But I want to take this a step further because I want you to see how much greater this, this idea is. Now the word love that we, that we see, and it's, and it's all throughout John 14 through 17, it's one of the, the key truths that's found in the Bible. But, but I think specifically when we look down at, God's, or at, at John's gospel, is we find so much about the love that the Father and the Son share together and inside of now their triune nature, their fullness of God with the Holy Spirit. And what's crazy is what we learn from John and what we learn through the rest of the New Testament is we can experience that same love through grace. I'm not talking that mamby-pamby movie love. I'm not talking the, rom the rom-com. I'm not talking that kind of love. No, that's love, but I'm talking something greater. This unconditional, fervent, passionate, never-ending love that flowed from the Father to the Son to the Spirit in this powerful way. But God's love for his people is gonna come in a different, and I would even say this, a, a special way. It's a love, like I said a second ago, it, 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 it's born of grace. You see, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit would still be Father, Son, and Holy Spirit even if they never chose to love people. It's in their nature. 
The Godhead has, has loved each other eternally and fully and committedly. Yet one of the most astounding aspects of the new you and what continues to build this idea of what makes it greater is that when God chooses to love his people, it's with the same character and the same love that it happens between the Father and the Son and the Spirit. It's of that exact nature. Another way of putting it is that, that, that the relationship that the son enjoys with the father by, by virtue of being his, his one and only son, we now can experience by grace as his adopted children. That's crazy. It's not a human love. It's not a defective love. It was love in its fullest meaning because it was shared between the Godhead I think that's why Jesus prayed in the night. If, if you got your Bibles, maybe, or maybe on your phones, you need to thumb down or something, whatever. Turn over to verse 23. I think this is where it gets so powerful. Because on the night that Jesus was praying, he, he was just resting in, and I would say even relishing in the knowledge, look at this, of the Father loving his people even as he loved Christ. Verse 23. That's crazy. that love is explained a little bit more. If you go back to John 14 in verse 20, you see that God's people not only have the spirit in them, but, but look at verse 20. The followers of Christ are in him. They're in Christ. What Jesus meant was that these guys, those of us in Christ, would be so intimately connected to Christ that, that when the Father sees us, he sees us in his Son. We are loved with that same kind of love. This truth is why Paul wrote in, in Romans 8, 31 through 35, this idea that nothing can separate this, us from this love of God. In order for, for, for God to cease loving us, he would have to cease loving the son, but we know that would absolutely never happen. Even right now, and I just want you to know this, if you feel like you are one who could never be loved, you feel unlovable, if you are one who is in Christ, you have the same love flowing from the father that the son experiences, you have the full love of our triune God coming at you, and that is powerful. That's crazy. God's people are that intimately connected. In verse 23, not only is the spirit in this, again, I just want to keep building this idea of this greater reality that we live in, but the father and the son also, now look at that, make their home with us. This relationship that God's people have with them, as I said from the beginning, it's this, this deep yearning that humanity has longed for since the beginning. It was the, 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 the way in which God crafted us. We were crafted for this type of love relationship that we we're to share with him. It was what humanity lost when we, when we rebelled against God, that capacity to be with him in that kind of love. But what's even nuttier that John writes about later in, John, in, in, in Revelation 21.3 is that it's that love that we will experience forever when, we, when, when, the, when Jesus announced this idea that the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and he will be their God. That is the hope that we have for one day. We will forever rest in that relationship with the Father. And in an astonishing way, in some way that is so hard to understand, this presence of God that Jesus' followers can experience now is just merely a taste of what God has in store for us. But it is real now. I was thinking about this even the other day. The last two humans outside of Jesus Christ to experience this kind of love were Adam and Eve. And for those of us that live on the other side of the cross, that live on the other side of the empty tomb, that now live with the reality that the spirit is with us and in us, we can experience that. Now let me develop this out a little bit more to help you understand why it's greater. 
I was thinking about my, my, my children the other day. And if, if you're like me as a parent, oh gosh, we just struggle with our kids obeying, don't we? And so we tell them to obey and we warn them and we do different things to try to get them to obey. Now what's so powerful, what happens here is God is a God to be feared and he is a God that has wrath. There's no way I wanna ever eclipse that reality, but you know this, that fear and wrath and even what humans do, manipulation, can only cause obedience for a while. But there is something so real about love, this atmosphere that God gives us. And if I really want my kiddos to obey, I need to do what the Father does in my life and provide this atmosphere of love love because it is in that now when I love my kiddos and my kiddos love me when the father who we know loves us and we love the father something powerful starts to happen inside of the lives of believers and this is where it starts to get excitingly practical see life in Christ the Holy Spirit is meant to be not just something that we know about but something that's to be experienced See, for the first time in, God, in John's gospel, he speaks of, of God's love, of God's people, more specifically, of God's people's love for him. He says in there in verse 15, if you love me, you will keep and obey or obey my commandments. Verse 23, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word or obey my word. Verse 28, if, any, if you loved me, you would have rejoiced because I'm going to the Father. If you love me love me. Now, sometimes people that take this and they'll say, well, because I don't obey, then I must not love God. Well, that could be the case, no doubt, but I think there's something so much more real and so much more powerful happening here. See, I think what he's talking about is from a growing love for Jesus, from a, a passionate love of living inside of the love of the Father in relationship with him, of knowing him, loving him, following him, it is from that now that we obey. If you love me, well, what's the outcome? Well, you'll obey. You will be the people that God's intended you to be. See, I think too often, I think we, we passionately, we, we want to obey God, so we try to stir up everything we can within us to have that type of obedience. We, we even ask ourselves, what's wrong with me because, because I can't seem to obey Jesus like I want to? Then after multiple futile attempts at obedience fail, kind of at every turn, we, we give up and we kind of just go with the flow. And I, and I firmly believe that when I get this way or you get, get this way, we just live in this stagnant, icky mediocrity. We just kind of float. But I think more dangerously are like those religious leaders of Jesus' day. They, they honestly think they can muster enough power and oftentimes in order to do that, they have to create a system of their own making. They have to display a God of their own making. And then what they do is after they create that little system, they look down upon other people as somehow they've arrived and those other people don't get it. And what both groups of people miss is that it doesn't come from that. It comes from that passionate love relationship that we can share in with our triune God and knowing that and learning it and loving it and experiencing it in such a way that out of that now our obedience flows because we love God. See, I think sometimes we throw it around just trivial, you know, I love God. No. See, this is what Jesus did at the, at the very end of John where he's sitting down with Peter, right? Peter's just denied him three times. And he doesn't come to Peter and say, Peter, what's wrong with you? Why don't you just obey me? Why did you fail so much? Oh, Peter, do you even love me? He instead looks at him and just asks this question three times, the same amount of times Peter denied him. Peter, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? See, it's from that love that that relationship flows. And from it now comes obedience or us living as God intended. Peter, if you love me, then go feed my sheep. Do what I've created you to do. I didn't create you to fish fish. I created you to fish men. Peter, do you love me? So you start building all of these things together and you start to go, oh man, that's why it's greater. 
It's greater because Jesus left and his Holy Spirit came in and amongst us. He, he left, but that doesn't mean he left because he's still making his home with us. The, we are now in Christ and therefore the Father loves us just as much as the Son. And now out of that power and out of that love, we now can actually be the people God intended. What those before the cross and before the empty tomb and before the coming of the Holy Spirit could never experience. We now can do the works that Jesus did. Only these works are greater than anything they ever imagined until the coming of the Holy Spirit. That's us. Now let me just talk to those of you from Cornerstone right now, those of you that are followers of Jesus. This is why we did what we did back in the fall of just getting into those disciplines. Why? Not so that you could know more Bible knowledge to be able to, you know, do well in Bible trivia. We were drawing near into the presence and pathway of God to know him and understand him, to experience in a new and a powerful way that love that forever is showered on us in and through the person and work of Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit and the great heart of God. I want you to know God. I want you to be with him because when you are with him and as we look at the life of Jesus, that's what we did in the second series, what can begin to come out of us is we can walk as Jesus walked. We can display the character of God. We can be the people that God intends us to be. I don't want you this week to settle for anything less. Don't you dare. You have been placed in the most privileged position since the, be, since the fall of humanity. Don't you dare sell your birthright as a child of God for a bowl of soup when he is offering you the ocean. Don't. Draw near to that God. If there's sin that's keeping you away, then come and confess it. And the beauty we'll learn in 1 John is that he, that he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Why? That he might draw us to him. But let me speak to those of you that may be listening this morning that don't know Jesus. Listen, gosh, I know your heart. I was in that spot too. I remember just that longing, gosh, I just, I wanted to live in that new place. I wanted to be the new me. I was so in many ways sick with who I was. I get that. And I think that's what makes John 14, 6 so powerful. Jesus is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. But what your heart is truly longing for what you truly want more than you know is this next part of John 14, 6. He is the way to the Father. All that love that all of us are seeking for all our lives seems so hollow and shallow. But when you encounter the God of the universe, your heart, what you were created for, will finally leap for joy and understanding who you are in light of this God that adores you. And today, all you have to do is bend your knee to King Jesus, to repent, to say, I have pursued all these things with wrong motives for myself. I knew my heart was longing for something greater. I just didn't realize it was you. And because of the work of Jesus Christ, and because of his tomb, the empty tomb, <laughs> you can come to him. Don't leave today without bending that knee. So would you all pray with me this morning? Father, thank you so much for today. Thanks for your word. Thanks for the truth of, of who you are as our great triune God. Father, I pray you were pleased with our singing. I pray you were pleased with our time in the word. May there be more people empowered by your Holy Spirit because he's in us to understand the nature of what it means to be in your son, Jesus Christ, 
as ones fully and wholly and totally and forever loved by you. And may that grow our love for you so that we might be the people you've intended us to be, I beg you. In your precious name we pray, amen.